A few months ago in London, 5,000 people gathered outside one large teaching hospital to demonstrate their opposition to the hospital's refusal to allow women choice in childbirth. In the past 15 years, Britain has seen its maternity services increasingly centralised in large hospitals. The experience of pregnancy overwhelmed by technology and the experience of childbirth subverted in the name of safety. Today, women reclaim their bodies and reclaim birth as an intimate personal act. Birth as mystery and wonder. Birth as a celebration of life. That this dissatisfaction found its voice in a demonstration of over 5,000 against the policies of one hospital is a sad reflection of the very real problems that our maternity services face. For many mothers, the sense of alienation starts here, at the antenatal clinic. Devoted to problem solving en masse, these clinics have often defeated their main aim. For this depersonalization has made them so unattractive that the very women who need them most are reluctant to attend. This film is about a few examples of good practice in antenatal care that have emerged during the last few years. Yet so pervasive has this policy of centralization been that we had to go to Scotland to find our only example of a sensible compromise that could be supported by statistics. The Edinburgh skyline. 20 years ago, the depopulation of this city started. From the old properties in the city centre and around the port, hundreds of people were moved. By the early 70s, the trickle had become a flood as thousands of families were moved every year to the large estates that now ring the city. Two of the largest, Sighthill and Westerhales, lie south of the city along the main roads that lead to the airport and the Scottish border. Of the 23 wards that make up the city of Edinburgh, eight years ago, Sighthill had the fourth highest perinatal mortality rate, the fourth highest number of children born with a physical handicap, and the third highest incidence of congenital malformation. Dr. Ian McKee is the senior partner at the Sighthill Health Centre. Dr. Armand Smith, one of our local community physicians, did a differential survey of the perinatal mortality rates in Edinburgh and found that although people were going to the same hospitals, there was a mammoth difference in perinatal mortality rates between the well-off areas and the areas near the hospital and areas such as ours where there was a high degree of poverty and the patient had a long way to go to the hospital. And this was quite important because we don't have much private practice in Edinburgh, so this was covering the entire community, and yet the same health service was giving such a differential standard of care. At that time, the Sighthill Health Centre, which cares for almost the whole population of Westerhales and Sighthill, was locked into a system of antenatal care whereby most of the mothers were receiving their care at the Simpson Memorial Hospital, an expensive six-mile bus journey to the centre of Edinburgh. Significantly, 40% of women were late in booking for their first antenatal appointment. Word had got round that the system was expensive in time and bus fares, poorly organised and, most significant for the consumer, alienating. Yet the skills and resources to provide comprehensive antenatal care had been back at the Sighthill Health Centre all the time. Historically, uh, it was not all that long ago that we did an awful lot of domiciliary deliveries. And so the community midwifery service is still geared to deliver a lot of babies at home. But of course, very few people now do have their babies at home. So the midwives were out here already, but doing very, very little. By the same tradition, general practice was used to dealing with a lot of domiciliary deliveries. So in the, um, amongst the general practitioners in the area, there was a large interest in in obstetric matters, but uh, over a really comparatively short time, all this had been taken out of our hands and we were just left with the rump of it. So there were quite a few frustrated workers in the community. Uh, they didn't need to be deployed, they were here already. So what we'll do is come and visit you at home and just check, see that it's down. Sometimes just come into the clinic, get you a wee bit. For the last six years, this health centre had been running its own community-based antenatal scheme. And with the exception of women who are diabetic or who have major cardiac problems, no mother is refused entry into the scheme. 
I think the um, the idea came in it from a variety of different sources, more or less at the same time. Uh, as general practitioners, we weren't very happy about the situation, um, but I wouldn't like to claim the credit that we actually got off our bottoms and did something about it. Uh, at the same time that this situation existed out here at, at Side Hill, uh, the, some consultants were a bit unhappy because they could see from their side that the service that was so much money was being spent on wasn't actually coming out with the goods in the end. Um, are you on any medication at the moment? Any medicines? No. Nothing. Good. No. Are you a smoker? Stopped on the first of August. You stopped on the first of August. <laughs> and on the eleventh day, we the doctor takes over and we come in and then we look after the baby from there and collect transfer. For GPs Health visitors and midwives used to an almost totally hospital-orientated maternity service. The changeover was difficult. There's an awful lot of problems at the beginning because we just weren't used to taking that sort of responsibility. Nice to have just sitting here. You can't spend years and years of seeing normal people uh, and being conditioned to referring them on to someone else at the slightest abnormality. You can't get used to that sort of situation and then um, find that all of a sudden you've got to take a responsibility making a decision for yourself. And it took us um, a good few months before we developed enough confidence in ourselves again to take over more and more of, of the clinic. And I think it's necessary if you're starting up this sort of venture to have a consultant who's quite prepared to mother you through the initial phases until you've redeveloped the confidence in your own ability to make decisions. But it comes back. The ability and confidence to take decisions was seen by the senior consultant at the Simpson Maternity Hospital as being crucial in the handing back of responsibility to the community medical services. For every member of the team to feel confident enough to take responsibility, a framework or protocol for investigation and management needed to be devised. That's grand, Mrs. Munger, to do this hard something not easier. <laughs> the basis of the protocol at Sighthill is this card. At the first interview at the antenatal clinic, each mother is formally assessed by noting features of the pregnancy against a checklist of risk factors and evaluating their significance. From these factors, a planned program of management automatically follows. At the end of each clinic, the whole team, doctors, midwives and health visitors, discuss the progress of each mother's pregnancy, using the risk card as the basis for decision making. Build up a relationship with is she? Mm -hmm. She is uh, para one plus not, but her last pregnancy was about 18 years ago. Um, so this one came as a bit of a surprise. In fact, it was, it was the last thing she thought that was wrong with her when she came in with morning sickness and tentative rest. She's 37 in December, so she's a candidate for, for you know, problems of, of age. Um, there are two factors there, in fact, her age that she's 37, 38. So we may run into problems with blood pressure with her. She's also had two DNCs, I think in 1967 and 73, again, which may affect the uh, cervical competence. So she would come under the protocol for, for cervical assessment. Um, there's a family history of diabetes. I think if her grandfather had maturity onset diabetes. If we have a protocol, which is just another way of saying we've all agreed what to do in a certain circumstance. It means that when that circumstance arises, even the lowest member of the team, such as the general practitioner, can uh, then take a decision with the full knowledge that the protocol is backing him or her up. Actually, by her own date, she's at 38 weeks, but they've taken the scan date, put the mini visor on, um, BPD came in at 9.2 centimetres, which is turning in with 36 weeks. Mm -hmm. I took blood for East Jules and HPL because her last one that she'd had last week tended to be a bit on the low. The impact of these factors on the standard of obstetric care at Sight Hill has been impressive and it's possible to make a before and after comparison as the scheme has now been in operation for six years and to study objectively the results from a thousand births within the scheme comparing them with the equivalent number that took place from the same area but whose mothers received their care at a hospital. The difference is striking so too compared with the rate for Scotland. In fact, the Sighthill scheme has one of the lowest perinatal mortality figures for anywhere in Britain, 
and these figures have been achieved in a predominantly working class population. More specifically, the scheme has shown a dramatic increase in early presentation and a decrease in the default rate. Mothers are happy with the scheme. The number of inductions has been halved. So too have forceps and premature deliveries and admissions to a special care baby unit. And there's been a decrease in low birth weight babies. It's been said that a high perinatal mortality rate is linked to poverty and that health workers cannot influence this relationship. In an area where the majority of the families are from income groups four and five, the example of Sight Hill questions this assumption and at a lower cost than a hospital-based scheme. I think the important thing, quite honestly, is to show that things get no worse under a community antenatal care scheme. Our figures seem to show that the health of the community is very much better as a result of the scheme. But I, I don't think even that's important. I think the important thing is to show that these problems, um, and, uh, and one really shouldn't call antenatal care a problem, but the problems that can arise in antenatal care in the community uh, are best dealt with in the community. And if you can deal with something in the community at least as well as it can be dealt with in the hospital, then all common sense screams out that it should be dealt with in the community and not in the hospital. Conventional wisdom may scream out at us, but for most mothers living in urban areas, there is no choice. Hospital is where you receive your antenatal care. And it's at this moment that the sense of alienation with Britain's maternity services often starts. Conveyor belt isn't really the right word, for though impersonal, the word also implies efficiency. One thing these clinics are not. For once the doctor's minions have whisked you through this, the waiting starts whilst your case notes join the pile and the whole process is made even more inefficient by the strict proviso printed in large black letters. That file, full of dark secrets about your own body, is shunted from the hand of one expert to another, never allowed to be carried by the mother herself, even though it would cut the waiting time substantially. However, even in a large clinic, it doesn't have to be like that. This is the antenatal clinic at St George's Hospital Tooting, South London. Large and busy, but for a start, the mothers at least carry their own case notes. Yes, that was you when you were three months old. Mummy's tummy. There's the baby's head, and the body is here, and we're off to the side. So there's one, one baby. You can see the afterbirth on the back of the, of the womb, so that uh, that's going to be out of the way when it comes to having the baby. And then Georgina, it's you next. And then Susan. And then Mari Kane. Sister Caroline Flint took up posts at St George's a year ago with the clear brief to improve the antenatal service. Well, the very first priority, of course, was to get the waiting, the time that women waited to get that down, and i.e. to make a, a, a more reasonable appointment system. That was, that was the very first priority. And the way one did that was A, to find out what time the doctors actually arrived in the clinic. And, and, we, and I got the women to come just before they arrived. Not an hour or half an hour beforehand, but just before they arrived. That was the first thing. The other thing was to communicate with the women more, to say, I'm sorry you're waiting, but we've got two midwives off sick today and we've got a doctor who's in theatre. Or to say, well, just to explain, or to say, well, you've only got three more people in front of you and you're the fourth. So they knew what was happening. And I'm not shy, so I, I could, I was, that was all right. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing is that I, I labelled all the rooms so that women actually knew who they were going to see. And I talked very quickly, so if I'd said, you're going to see Dr Richmond today, and they actually saw it on the door, Dr Richmond, they could think, ah, I'm seeing Dr Richmond today. And so that next time they came, they could actually say to me, can I see Dr. Richmond again? Or if they didn't like Dr. Richmond, they could say, can I see anybody else but Dr. Richmond? So that they feel they have an element of choice. It was obvious that women are going to have to wait for a certain time. No clinic, I'm beginning to think, can ever run perfectly smoothly. So I thought the important thing was when they are waiting, that that waiting time 
should be valuable and exciting and, and stimulating. So we show films almost constantly. We have women who've had babies here to come back with their babies and to talk about what it's like having a baby here in this hospital, and what it's like living with a baby afterwards. I found that um, lying down, I just couldn't feel the right muscles. I couldn't work it out. Yet when I was on my hands and knees, sort of on all fours, I could feel what muscles I needed to push with. And that made a lot more sense. We have a crash for the children. We have a place where children can play. Tea and coffee, I mean, that's, that's really very important, but they should have some sort of refreshment while they're here. And the fetal models, you know, I've got that, those, all those, those babies in different sizes. Well, they're invaluable. Women love to see how far their baby's got to. And they actually can see it, they can actually hold it, so that's lovely. But behind this impressive array of activities lies something less obvious, but in many ways more important. An attitude in the care staff that can best be described as openness. At this clinic, women feel they can ask questions. That feels about right. What can you feel though? I can't <laughs> feel anything. Well, I'm feeling for the height of your womb. How, how high it comes up to, you know, it, yeah, compared to your date. And if you bring your hand up, both hands, if you put it there, can you feel it? Where yeah. just below the umbilical area. Yes. Yeah, that's where it comes to. And then if you feel the side, you can literally move your yeah. womb. So it's all can you? Yeah. And that's the baby. <laughs> Come down. I think you willed it to, didn't you? That's all it takes, you see, just a little bit. Just a, just a little bit of resting. Does eh? that give me a Yes, I think it reprieves it you. It does. How's that? Oh, thank Are you me. pleased? Yes, I Good. am very. <laughs> I don't think we need to rush at oh, an nice. induction, you see. I mean, normally, we, for a perfectly fit, healthy young lady like you, we would normally wait at least a week after right. the due date, because we know the due date isn't, is never that exact. No, quite. You see. I mean, it could be a week yes, either it could way. Yes, it could be a week either way. And all in all, I think it's quite safe to review it again next week. Well, Are you pleased? Yes, thrilled. And then we'll do it internal, and okay. I probably will try and persuade you then to... Right. Get things started. I'll be open to persuasion then. Right. <laughs> okay. All right, it's been See Thank you, you very much. Bye-bye. Start turning my mind about those. The tablets might have harmed the baby. You know what I mean? Yeah. And she, and she said to me, well, she said it wasn't mad. But, um, mm. it's been playing on my mind ever since, because I can't remember. But, Dan, it will play on, like, plays on everybody's mind. Until you've actually got the baby in your arms, you're off, you, it, it, such a lot of women worry about it. Mm. It's moving, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it moves. Remember when we heard the baby's heartbeat? Yeah. Beautiful. <laughs> it's lovely. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think I'm just letting everything get out of proportion. Though. Well, I mean, you've got a lot on your plate, haven't you? Yeah. Mm. Mm. No, it won't be long now. No, no. <laughs> it won't be long, will it? <laughs> lovely to see you. Bye-bye. Lovely. It may seem strange to highlight these exchanges. One would suppose that they were the first priority of all care staff. Yet, the way most antenatal clinics are run in large hospitals makes genuine communication very difficult, and the lack of interest in them is the main complaint of the women who have to use them. <laughs> Midwives, too, constantly complain about the role into which they have been forced, that of obstetric nurse, handmaiden to the all-powerful doctor. It's little wonder, then, that feeling themselves a beleaguered minority, they sometimes behave that way. A lot of midwives have lost a lot of confidence. There's no doubt about that. It so much depends upon how much support the midwife herself has got, how confident she is, the sort of experience she's had in the past, and the sort of experience that she has made herself have. You see, with, with all experiences, you can go through them and you can just exist through them, or you can go through them and you can learn every second of the time. So, in different situations, you can actually gain more experience from certain situations by, by your own attitude of mind. This sometimes happens in pregnancy. There's a, you, 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 some people get high blood pressure. And I looked at antenatal clinics and felt that they, this was a, a superb area where you could actually achieve something and you could really improve what was happening to women and, and how women were feeling about it. And you could actually do a lot. Breakfast in bed every morning. <laughs> yeah, six o'clock or something. <laughs> I don't think it's so hard for six. <laughs> <laughs>
actually starts. It's about eight o'clock. <laughs> so come, come, come and phone your husband in my office. <laughs> An honest recognition of the shortcomings of a centralised system is the first step to any change. King's College Hospital London has a small, overcrowded clinic combined with all the usual features. The waiting rooms that are more like greyhound traps, pokey corridors and overworked staff. But recognising that although they can't find the money to change the system for everyone, they have at least identified one group of women who need special antenatal care in a supportive setting. This small clinic was set up two years ago to provide a comprehensive service to teenage girls. It's staffed by a doctor, social worker, health visitor and midwife. It's your choice, but you've got to make the choice in a way. But you can only, you mustn't just walk out, you just walk out, you lose your rights. It's the only way you can be... The team here give help and advice on a whole range of problems not normally associated with antenatal care. Problems of family tensions, welfare rights, unemployment and homelessness. Problems which need the support of a social worker and health visitor as much as the doctor and midwife. You also discuss generally how you're getting on at home with your family and so on. Okay. Now, uh, health visitors tend to work mainly from clinics, child health clinics. You find some are attached to GPs. Yeah, I'm just going to check out from here. Has gone down yet? I don't <laughs> I really don't know, Peggy Stewart. You don't know? Have you no. been feeling? No. Dr. Madeline Saunders has been running this clinic for the past 18 months. Well, have a feel on there and tell me what you think. The clinic started in early 1980. Basically, um, one of our ex-house officers, in fact, was working for the Department of Community Medicine, doing home visits on pregnant schoolgirls. And she found, talking to them and visiting them, that they really were missing out a lot as far as antenatal care was concerned and they sort of fell through large gaps in the standard antenatal system which I think is understandable. Tell me how many times these and they're moving now oh. all right but head is just sitting there yeah. okay let's just are you all right lying flat yeah, all right. you're not feeling dizzy one aim of the clinic is to make hospital per se a positive experience so that in the future if they have problems they might well turn to hospital or somewhere they know that at least they can come back there's no way that you know we could take the attitude which many people do and it's been said to me these girls cannot have their babies you have got to take all their babies away they've all got to have adoptions you can't do that and they don't get pregnant to get money I know many many people say to me oh, of course she's only got pregnant to get a council house or to get benefits it's rubbish um, and certainly some have had very poor home backgrounds no upbringing themselves and I mean, some of them just see that they actually want something to love them and they think the baby's going to do it now however wrong that is you can't dissuade them of that and we just feel that we want to try and get them to see these things in themselves and in their pregnancy so that if we can I mean Sheila Kitzinger is always saying you know the woman should be in the driving seat these girls don't drive their bodies non-pregnant let alone with a pregnancy on board so we just want to try and you know, get them to grips with themselves and their situation and try and make some sort of positive planning. I mean, obviously you have to talk that through with them and so that they understood that they weren't being nasty. For many young people, often with little idea of what to expect or even how they're going to cope, this clinic provides not just practical and emotional support through pregnancy, but because the girls attend the clinic over a period of months, the team can, through patient persuasion, help the large majority to organise their lives so that they and their newborn babies have a stable, well-supported environment to go home to. And with infant mortality, that is deaths in the first year of life among teenage mothers running at a staggering 34 per thousand, this kind of planning and support is crucial. At one stage, a kid could possibly go through pregnancy without letting out the problems and suddenly break down on the ward. I mean, I saw once where I was training a girl on the ward and the big ward ran came round and they said, oh, everything all right, going home today? And she said, yes. And in fact, I had talked to her as a student and I said to this consultant, look, you got the answer you asked for. That girl has nowhere to go. She has got no home and you have not given her any chance to tell you. There was a very interesting set, series of articles in Nursing Times which talked about communications in nursing and showed actually how 
we frequently stop women talking by saying something like, you're looking very well, and not actually giving them an opportunity to say, actually, I feel terrible, because they're worried about your blood pressure. And are you swollen at all? It may seem strange to end this film with an obvious comment, but it's often the obvious comment that is the least palatable. The simple fact is that the one overriding feature that is common to the three examples shown is the attitude of the care staff, a quiet confidence, approachability, and openness that women immediately recognize. And the benefits are obvious, as the statistics from Sighthill demonstrated. For if women find coming to an antenatal clinic a positive experience, a number of crucial factors will follow. Early presentation, effective screening, maximum cooperation, lower risk, and, to put it simply, happier mothers and healthier babies. But I think that should be okay. Now, baby kicking?